You're listening to the One on One Football Podcast, the number one podcast for Aussie rules training, coaching, and development tips. Welcome back to the One on One Football Podcast. My name is Harry Simmington, co host of the show. In today's episode, we're going to run things slightly differently. We've got a different format to usual. Now, normally we'll have a guest uh, with us live in the studio or the virtual studio, but Today, what we're going to do is play the recordings from uh, an online live event that we hosted a couple of months ago on Grand Final Eve. Uh, The event was called the the Footy IQ Online Masterclass, uh, and it was uh, consisted of four sessions. So sessions one, two, and three um, were keynote presentations from uh, Michael Barlow, Josh Fraser, and Dale Tapping, respectively. Now, all three of those guys are coaches here on the platform, private coaches that you can book sessions with. Um, They each spoke on about a different topic. So Mick Barlow spoke about um, the importance of the fundamentals and some of the training drills and and coaching philosophies that he learned from uh, Choco Williams, who's uh, obviously a development coach with the Melbourne Demons. Um, Session number two was Josh Fraser. He spoke about uh, personal development plans and provided a template um, for how you can outline your strengths and weaknesses and um, and really build a a preseason around um, the components of your game that you want to improve. Uh, And then session three was with Dale Tapping. Um, That one was a a real crowd favorite where he went uh, very in-depth into midfield craft and structures. Now, if you don't know um, of Dale, he's uh, been an important cog in the Brisbane Lions midfield um, uh, system over the past couple of years working under Chris Fagan there and um, actually I think it was the day of the masterclass uh, he was announced as um, the new uh, one of the new assistant coaches at, at, at Essendon so um, a new job for Dale there um, the work that he's doing with the with um, and the knowledge that he has on on, on midfield development is um, is obviously uh, widely regarded so um, a fantastic session there in number three as well um, each of those sessions went for about 45 minutes and then right at the end of the masterclass, we uh, we had two guests on for a Q&A two special guests um, they were both all Australians this year uh, one of them being Katie Brennan who we've had on the podcast before um, obviously captain of the Richmond Tigers in the AFLW um, yeah like I mentioned she's had an exceptional year we spoke to her in her episode i think it was number seven on the podcast um when she was halfway through the season and um and richmond i think had just had their first uh their first ever win um not only this year but but all time as a club um so we spoke to her halfway through the season uh in that episode and um what you'll hear today is uh just at the end of the aflw season so she'd um uh, just wrapped up the season was, was is sort of getting ready to launch into um into season 2022 um so that's katie we spoke to her obviously alongside Tuke miller from the gold coast suns now Tuke's um uh had an exceptional year as well all australian honors himself um his first all australian jacket um hopefully uh, first of many throughout his career um, he was the best and fairest uh, with the Gold Coast Suns and um, and uh, during the season actually, I think, became the, the record holder, the all-time record holder for consecutive games with, with 30 or more disposals. So um, fantastic, uh, two fantastic guests uh, that we had on the masterclass and um, and session four uh, was 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 uh, so well uh, received by our audience members and um, listening back to the recordings myself and and Rainsy will, will say the same that it was um, yeah too good a um, too good a, a conversation not to to share it with our podcast podcast audience as well so um, that was our motivation to to bring it to you today um, in the in the format of the podcast um, now the format's going to be slightly different to usual um, obviously we we try and make uh, our episodes as, as conversational as we can. Um, here on the show but um the what we had for the oh sorry the format that we had for the the master class was um a q a but the questions were submitted by the audience so um we had them submit them in in advance and you'll hear me read out the audience's questions to um, both Tuke and katie um uh, throughout uh the episode today uh, so it's a little bit more stop start we sort of um uh, yeah didn't flow quite as much as what we liked on the podcast but um the content is is absolutely fantastic and um yeah just listening to to the perspectives that both of these guys have on on not only development and leadership but um uh, but uh, life outside of football as well is um yeah is is too good not to share so um that's about all of the housekeeping i think um if you're listening to this on spotify we'd love it if you could um 
uh, make sure you're following and subscribing. It uh, it makes it makes a huge difference. Um, on I think on Apple Podcasts, if you're listening on Apple, you can actually leave a review as well, which is um, which is even more just as helpful. Um, and if you're on if you're watching it, the, the recording back on uh, YouTube, then obviously make sure you're subscribing to the show. Um, just quickly before we get stuck into the um, into the episode, uh, if you're interested in listening to the first three sessions, so um, Mick Barlow, Josh Fraser, and Dale Tapping, their keynote presentations, you can actually access them on our website. Just go to one on footballcomau and up the top you'll see a little tab called eShop. Um, you'll be able to purchase the um, the session recordings there if you're interested. Um, in, in those ones and obviously session four we're about to play for you now so no need to to chase that one up um yeah so we'll get stuck into it guys i won't uh, i won't talk for too much longer um this is episode number 14 of the one-on-one football podcast with uh, special guests tuke miller and katie brennan enjoy fantastic so um just before we um before we start chatting to um the guest speakers i'll just get uh i'll just play this little introduction that Randy's prepared and we'll be into it soon. Welcome everyone to session four. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, today's two guests. Um, I think everyone has been for the duration of the day. Um, I'll introduce our first um, speaker, Cady Brennan. Um, she's uh, obviously a champion AFLW player and, and one of the true uh, pioneers um, setting new standards and leadership and professionalism since the league's inception in 2016. In season 2021, Katie led the Tigers to their first ever win, and after a standout season individually, she was recognised with all Australian honours. She also took out the Tigers' leading goal kicker award and finished second in the Tigers' BNF. Um, we had her on board the uh, the one-on-one football podcast in episode eight, where Katie gave some incredible insights into the three pillars of her game preparation, into the three um, pillars of her game day preparation, which was mind, body, and craft. Um, today, Katie will be answering your questions along with our fellow um, guest speaker, Tuke Miller, which I'll give a, uh, a great introduction to now, Tuk, um, who's obviously just uh, come off the back of a fantastic year, a breakout year for Tuke. I was fortunate enough to, to play with Tuki um, in his first year and my last year of my AFL career. So I've got a great relationship with uh, with him. He's one of the hardest working um, players I've ever seen. Um, and, and on the back of that fantastic year, he's obviously awarded um, his, with his first All-Australian jacket. Um, and he had, I think it was over, broke the all-time AFL record for consecutive games um, of 30-plus disposals. Um, he won the Suns Best and Ferris um, and finished with um, career high brown low votes the other night. Turk is known as um, as a seven four for his hard work and dedication um, and his tra- high training standards and ultra-professionalism. Um, session four is brought to you by uh, latest and newest and most exciting um new service, uh, Coach on Coach Mentoring, where junior or upcoming um, community-based uh, coaches are looking for, um, for, for progression and, and obviously a tutelage in their coaching can now book a more experienced coach um, via our system and our platform. It's all done through the system. Um, you don't have to go anywhere. Zoom is embedded into our platform and our system. So when you book the coach, you'll get a link um, to, uh, to meet them online. Um, and what a great way to uh, to um, you know get um, upskill your coaching. We've got some great coaches. Damien Carroll, head of uh, Collingwood, um, head of Collingwood um, Development, on there. Josh Fraser, who was a speaker earlier. Dale Tapping. So these guys, um, as you see, can present really well. So it's an, an unreal um, advantage now to be able to link in with them one on one and then do some um, do some coach mentoring. So if there's any aspiring coaches out there, um, book in. Um, we're looking forward to. Um, obviously this service and, and, and getting it up and running recently. Um, there's some exciting times ahead for coaches around the country. Um, welcome on board, Turk and Katie. Um, it's been a, obviously a pleasure to have you on board um, and we're really looking forward to, uh, to you presenting today. Thanks, guys. Awesome. So uh, the way we'll run this one, guys, um, you've all submitted your questions uh, for Turk and Katie uh, when you registered. So uh, we'll go through some of those ones uh, now. Um, we'll alternate between Turk and Katie. Um, so guys, we might start off, uh, if you just get you to um, take your microphones off mute. Okay, yeah, beautiful. Um, so guys, welcome, thanks for joining us. Uh, Katie, I might start with you. Um, just before we get into the questions, what does Grand Final Week look, look like for you um, and, uh, uh, and also most of the AFLW players, obviously a different schedule um, to, the, to the AFL? Yeah, 
thanks, Harry, and um, it's great to be here, guys. Um, grand final week, yeah. So we um, we found out it would have been a couple of months ago now that our season has been uh, brought forward. So we're now starting in um, January, which will be really exciting for for the league and for the girls. Um, so at this stage, we're about I think 15 weeks out from uh, the season starting. So we're well into pre-season. We've had um, a nice little chunk of winter training and the programs we've been able to do within the club. And we're, uh, we're really lucky to not be restricted as well. We're allowed into the club and to be training as a, a full group, um, really fortunate to do so. And um, so, yeah, pre-season's really heating up. We've had um, all of our, our testing, uh, as you do in the initial weeks, to know the, uh, the old time trials and the skin folds. Um, not always the, the favourite thing to do, but um, no, it's been really good. It's been a really strong start from from our girls and um, yeah, we're really looking forward to just building off the momentum that we've, um, you know, started with last year and, and um, going into the season uh, really strongly. And, and took for yourself, mate, um, are you still in holiday mode at the moment? Are you, are you having a bit of a break from footy or um, have you started your, your training again uh, leading into season 2022? Yeah, um, no, thanks for having me on, by the way. Um, we, we have started our training. We had two weeks of quarantine. Um, when we first finished the season. So we we're kind of fortunate it was at home, but also like we go into the club. So it was like half quarantine, but we, um, yeah, we, we, we honestly just started training. So last, probably this week, we started to get into it. Um, it's been, yeah, it starts pretty light and then just starts to build up over, over the off season. And then by the time we get back to, to pre-season, like, like Katie said, we, uh, we get into the testing and, all the fun stuff once you get back. But, um, yeah, so we're, we're kind of just kicking off things now. Beautiful. And um, the first question comes in from Sally. Uh, Sally's actually uh, a former Gold Coast Suns AFLW player um, too. So uh, she's moved since uh, since leaving the AFLW, she's moved back to Ballarat. Um, but she'd just like to know uh, when things are tough and results aren't going your way uh, week after week, what strategies do you use uh, to stay motivated and disciplined? Um, and then how that might link to, to um, kids losing motivation in lockdowns if they're in Victoria. Yeah, well, it's, um, it's a good, uh, great question, Sally. It's funny, like, I mean, unfortunately, we probably haven't, haven't had the success that we want over the over the past few years. But I think personally, like, how I find motivate myself is sometimes you got to think about what, like, what the bigger picture is. So... I mean, for us, like, our big goal is we want to win premierships as a team and we want to be a successful club. You don't just want to win one. You want to be, like, you look at, like, Sydney, Geelong, teams that have been up there for so long. That's the type of club we want to make um, and we want and we want to be a part of that. So, for us and, and for myself, always thinking bigger picture of what, what's going to make us better. So, yes, we might get beat really badly a few times, but in saying that, it only takes one or two games that can change your season. So... And I look at this year, like we, we lost a few games by a few kicks. Um, we win those games and you're probably staring down the barrel of the finals. So it, it's amazing what just those those small wins can have, have a big impact. And then even percentage, like things like that, you just see always chasing, chasing consistency, chasing being hard to play against um, and just chasing a really good brand of football. So, um, yeah, there's, there's always a goal to chase. Um, and I think that's what drives me is just – um, personally and as a team, this is there's always something to chase. Beautiful. And Katie, um, Andy has submitted a question for you. Um, what do you find most challenging about being a, a team captain as opposed to being uh, a, a normal player? Yeah, thanks, Andy. Um, I think the probably the thing that you find um, most challenging, but to, to put a spin on that, most rewarding as well, that you've you've just got to come out of yourself in your own head and your own mind. And I think that, um, you know, at times where you might not um, be in great form and you not, may not be playing your best footy, that's probably the, the most challenging part about it. But it's also, um, as I said, the most rewarding where, um, you know, you, you sort of have to find different ways around um, whether, it, whether it is sort of um, pushing through a form slump or, um, you know, trying in, trying to inspire the, the girls around you um, in order to, to get some wins on the board or create some momentum. So, um, yes, it is, um, it is challenging at times, but I find that um, it's also, you know, great to, to be able to think about other people, to bring others along, to try and, um, you know, upskill others as well in, in certain areas, um, whether it's just in, individually or, or more so, um, you know, playing and executing the game plan. Um, but, yeah, with that, there's there's definitely challenges um, along the way. 
Um, and I just think it makes you a, a better person and a better footballer. Beautiful. And uh, Matthew would like to know too, as a 15 year old, what were your habits like and uh, how and why did they get better? Oh, as a 15 year old, I can't say my habits of what they were <laughs> or, or what they are now. Um, <laughs> I probably thought I knew it all back then, ten foot tall and bulletproof, but um, not so the, not so the case. Um, no, I think when, to be honest with you, when I was growing up, it, it's funny. Like it's more the journey of what, or the progression over time of what you learn, who you talk to, the coaches you talk to, the interactions you have with um, with people as you go. So I can't say my my habits were perfect when I was younger. Um, but in saying that, I feel like I probably listened to the right people over time and probably created the type of person I am today. Um, and it, it's not necessarily your footy. It might not be your, your head footy coach. It could be anyone. It could be a teacher. It could be mum or dad. Um, could be a cousin. There's just It depends who you trust and, and who you really want to follow in your life. And I think that's probably what shapes you a bit. So, um, yeah, it's funny. Like, as a 15-year-old, I was all about footy. Um it was just literally anything to do with footy. Well, I was watching it, playing it. Um, I used to get nervous about all the games that I played or anything that I did, both on and off the field, um, which is which is part and parcel of it. This is how it is. Um, so yeah, so I probably there's probably no one specific thing um, that I would say that my habits have, have changed or been the right thing. But I, I think when you're growing up, it's just important that um, you listen to the right people and people that you trust, um, and then that's probably going to shape what you're going to do when you get older. Beautiful. And uh, Katie, this one comes in from Lachlan. Uh, could you just give yeah, a bit of an overview of what, a, what an off-season looks like? Yeah, Lachlan, our um, off-season, it probably goes, well, it does go a lot longer than what the boys um, have at the, at the moment. So we play, um, obviously, in the summer over that sort of 10-game um, period plus finals now. Um, and it's built up over the years. We started on seven games and every year we've added an extra home and away game. So we actually have quite a, a large off season. Um, so sometimes it, it is quite challenging um, because we're not sort of contracted as full-time athletes at the club uh, during that time. So we have our, our programs um, that we do away from the club. Um, but in terms of how much training, it sort of builds up from, um, as Tuk said, having, those, having that deload period and, and having a few weeks off post-season. Um, and then you start to sort of build into it uh, slowly. But at this stage during the preseason, it's usually three runs per week, three gym sessions, and then just extra sessions around that, whether it's pool-based sessions or, um, or off-legs conditioning. Um, we do gymnastics and some boxing at the club as well. So um, in, I guess, the, the pre-season phase, we're starting to, to move more into the footy, um, the footy training aspect where we're out on the ground and we're doing more craft and and training drills, but prior to that, it's probably more so, um, yeah, your volume running, um, your gym sessions, and just building up, um, building up your tank essentially to be able to to get out there and, and do more footy stuff through that preseason. Beautiful. Um, and two, this one comes in from Troy. Uh, what has been the most influential lesson you learned in transforming from a junior to a professional player? Oh, that's a good question. Um... I honestly believe I started to a bit of what I was talking about before, but I honestly just started to trust the people that were in my inner circle. Um, so when I say that, like I'm talking about um, my high performance manager, so Alex Rigby. Um, so he looks after, you know, your running, your weights, um, it kind of has an overview of everything. Um, and then I know people like uh, my midfield coach and Josh Franco, Shuey Jude, John Haynes, when he, when he was there, um, I think I just, yeah, it was, it, it sounds weird, but those, those people that you build relationship, relationships with um, and start to trust, I think is what's transformed me into the person that I am today in terms of as a player and especially this year. Um, I feel like I gave, I gave more to them. They gave more back, um, both leadership-wise and on field. So, um, yeah, I just feel like that's, that's really helped me, helped me grow as a player. Um, that, that trust, especially um, on field. I know Stewie gave me the reins a bit more and in, in how I can play. And, um, you know, he let me be more attacking. He let me um, be a stronger leader out in the field. Um, and then that's probably transferred off the field as well. We're trying to help um, some of the younger players develop themselves um, as players on and off. So, yeah, I think for me, it's definitely just been the ability to trust those people around me that they're going to do their job for me to make me the best person, best player that I possibly can. So, 
um, yeah, I think it's really important. Awesome. And Katie, this one's from Matthew. Uh, what are some things that you use to motivate yourself um, to love the elite athlete lifestyle? Obviously quite different to uh, if you're not an elite athlete. Yeah, um, Matthew, I think probably, um, I guess the, the challenge of wanting to, to be better and wanting to improve, I think that, um, you know, 1% is, is a big difference when you're an athlete and um, you sort of go after uh, those gains, essentially. Um, as I mentioned before, our off season's quite long and so you've got to find different ways to motivate yourself and, and get better through that period without, um, without almost overloading. I I'd, I'd have definitely been known to... Um, you know, overtrain in, in the past and I'm starting to learn as I'm getting older, it's more about um, the quality over the quantity and, and doing, I guess, different things to, to get better, whether that's watching vision or um, working on more of your mindset, um, um, imagery, those type of things that can sort of get you better off the field that don't require putting load through your body. Um, so, yeah, there's certainly many things that help to, to motivate me. And I think going back to what Tuke said earlier about um, chasing the ultimate glory, it's something that I've been really lucky to play in, in premierships sort of leading into AFL Women's. And um, we were lucky to win one at the Dogs in the second year of AFL Women's. Um, and now coming across to Richmond and, and sort of starting afresh and and um, really be, being in that um, the building stage, similar to uh, what the Suns are, being that, that new startup team. And um, you, you sort of go after wanting to um, improve the processes, wanting to, um, you know, get the most out of yourself and, and all of your, your teammates in order to, to start playing really competitive footy, going after those finals, uh, final series. And, and then hopefully, um, yeah, one day sort of, going after the, the grand final and, and holding the cup up. So I think certainly keeping those larger visions of where you want to go um, in, in sort of the, the back of your mind essentially, but creating really strong processes in order to, to get there and keep improving, that helps to motivate me. Fantastic. And uh, Steve's got a couple of questions here. So Tuke, um, you've had a fantastic year of footy individually. Uh, what clicked for you this year? Um, and also as a follow-up, what do you consider to be the characteristics of leadership? Yeah, that's a good question, Steve. Um, I think, honestly, for me, what clicked this year is my ability to be offensively damaging. Um, I mean, growing growing up and the way I built my uh, my AFL career was off being like forward pressure, um, contest, always um, transition really hard. Um, I've always put a real pride on um, how I run and my work rate. Um, and I think that that's something that's helped me shape what I do now. So... Um, I think this year what changed and I think in the light of other people was the fact that I was able to obviously get my hands on the footy but be more offensively damaging, hit the scoreboard a few times, um, ability to get involved in chains um, and, and help the team um, have a bit more and have a bit more impact. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's probably that's probably the most specific thing. Um, and then from a leadership point of view, um, I, I just truly believe that um, the, the most influential thing that I learned from leadership is the only way you can lead is if people will follow you. So I don't know if I, I feel like if I'm not, I'm not doing my job, if people don't want to follow what I'm doing. So when I step out in the field um, and, you know, I'm trying to lead and be consistent um, and back every game up, um, that's me trying to do my job. And I feel like that's something that when you're a leader, that's what you have to do. Um, you can't turn up one week, not turn up the next week. You have to be super consistent. You have to be hard to play against every single time you, every single time you step out in the field, um, or people just won't follow you. So, I feel like for us and as a team at the Gold Coast, we want to be a team that wants to be hard to play against, be consistent. If your leaders aren't doing that, um, you can't expect that the rest of the team is going to follow. So, um, yeah, I just think it's super important to set an example. Um, and for me, my setting examples a leader is an example through my actions. I'm trying to get better from um, in terms of a, a voice point of view, be harder on the field, be sharper, be more edgy. Um, but I think they'll come with time as I get older. Um, it's, it's not something that comes naturally, but that is something that will come with time. So um, at the moment, still trying to lead with action um, and hopefully boys will follow. But I think it's super important. You need people to follow you or you, you're just not probably doing your job properly. Fantastic. And uh, Steve would like to know, Katie, uh, where do you see the next phase of AFLW footy in terms of evolution from game style? Um, and what do you think are the most important priorities from the, for an aspiring female footballer skill-wise? Mm, yeah, great question, Steve. I think um, 
it's really interesting to see where the trend of, of our game is going. And I think we've, over the past five years, I actually think that we've gone through a few different trends in terms of where, um, you know, the, the teams that have won the flag, what sort of game style they've played in order to be successful. I think we started off with, with Adelaide, who are a bit more of a surge team, and they would, you know, take ground and, and really just surge the ball from contest to contest and just play the game in their forward half. Um, the second year, it was it was us, the Bulldogs, that, that won it, and we were a, a bit more of an uncontested footy side. We would, we would like to march the footy up and, and really control it in our back half and then sort of pull the trigger around that 40 to, to 70 zone, the, I guess the, the turnover city zone, and, and try and, um, you know, hit targets within get those marks with inside inside uh, Ford 50 and execute from there. And, and then Adelaide won it in the third year again with that surge type of, of footy. And fast forward to, to last year where um, Brisbane were the, the dominant team for for most of the year and, and coming out and winning winning the grand final. Um, they're playing at quite a defensive style of footy where they just set up their game in their back half and um, and once again take territory and, and use a bit more of a... Um, like a chaos type type of footy, a bit more of a, a Richmond brand, which we try to, to sort of emulate from our, our boys as well. So I think it's really interesting to see where the game is going. And I think the next phase will just be, um, you know, the girls upskilling within the contest, being able to, um, to really sort of win those one-on-ones um, and, and make sure that like we're, we're playing some good footy around the contest and then being able to use our skills a bit more on the outside and, I think to, to follow up with that question, where do you think the most important priorities for an aspiring footballer? I think it still starts within those fundamental skills. And, um, you know, any footballer, you, you need to start with those basic skills, being able to, um, to use the footy, particularly under pressure. Our game's getting faster and faster. And, um, you know, we certainly um, try and, and play, a, as I said, a chaos brand. And, and if you can execute those, those skills under fatigue as we're getting faster and, and, and under um, you know, more pressure. I think that that's sort of where um, the the aspiring football to, footballers should look at just being able to, to really execute. Fantastic. And uh, this one comes from Chris. Took, how much extra mental and physical work have you had to put in uh, to become an elite midfielder? Uh, yeah, good question, Chris. Uh, I think actually this year was probably the first time that I really went hard in the mental space. Um, it's funny, I think any coach, player or person has heard of oh, um, that mental space or what is um, when people are, they talk about like their mentality is I don't know, super strong or um, they're competitive or that, that side of, of um, competitive sport. Um, I think for me this year is the thing that I went at the hardest. Um, so we had a few people that came in, um, worked really closely with the psych at the club um, and then worked really closely with, um, a guy called Nam Ball and, and they literally worked on being consistent in that mental space and how you prep for a game. And that's, for me, um, this year I looked at when I was going into a game, I'd start with my mental, mental prep uh, on Thursday for a Saturday game. So I've got a football Bible, so I call it. Um, and I use that um, I use that every week leading into a game to then prep myself mentally to make sure I'm best prepared when when I get to the game um, and that just looks like though, just for a quick insight, it would look like I dump stuff that um, is not really relevant. So, you know, we could be, say we went to Melbourne for four weeks um, and we were doing hotel quarantine and things like that. So my ability to then dump those things on the page, um, try to forget that or at least put it somewhere so that um, I don't have to think about it during the game. And then as I'm leading into the game, I can then um, start to put things down that, I can focus on for the game that's going to help me um, and some triggers that can help me during the game if I start to fade off um, or I start to lose track of, you know, I might have a 10-minute patch where I've started playing really poor football or haven't seen the ball or haven't been involved. How can I get myself back to um, t- to my best? And I think that works with those triggers and from the build-up in my mental prep, I should be ready to be able to do that and perform. Um so yeah, I mean, this year that honestly, that's that's where I've gone. I've gone with it. I went the mental prep really, really hard. Um, that mental space, physically, I've always been probably someone who's always worked in my craft. Um, it's funny this year, um, I was starting to get a bit more notice for how I was actually using the ball. But that doesn't just happen in a year. Anyone knows in professional sport, you don't just flick a switch and you start uh, performing a skill better. It's just years and years of craft. So 
for me. I've been, I've been working my kicking for seven plus years since I've been in the club, trying, trying to make sure that's something that I can be really useful and effective with. And uh, it just happened to be this year. It, it started to get noticed and um, it, I mean, reward for effort sometimes, but um, yeah, one of those things physically, you just, you just always got to be prepared and um, just takes years of years of craft and training. So a bit of a combination, but that mental space, um, I think for anyone who is trying to improve himself um, is a place to explore 100%. That's cool. That's great insight. Um, and Katie, this one comes in from Amy. So uh, what did you have to do to make it to the AFLW? Yeah, Amy, that's a, um, it's a good question. I think um, it was a really different pathway for me, given um, the AFL women sort of started when I was, uh, I think it was 22 or so. So uh, the pathway is very different now. It's more complete and you can, um, you know, go through the ranks of, um, you know, playing school footy and playing for um, whether it's Victoria or Queensland, whatever it might be in the state programs and moving to the NAB League. And um, it's a, just a, a way more complete program as opposed to when I first started. Um, it was a little bit more clunky, but we were sort of on the way to creating something bigger and better being the A for Women's. And um, that's where I, I landed. But in order to to make it, um, I think anyone would say within any profession, it is a whole lot of hard work and um, you know, a whole lot of dedication to, to where you want to go. Um, I mentioned before, like creating a bit of a vision and where you want to get to and, um, and then almost breaking it down and forgetting, forgetting that vision. You know it's there and you know you want to get there, but it's all about creating a, a bit of a process and a bit, a bit of a plan as to, to where you want to go. And um, I think you talk to anyone that has made it into the AFL um, or the AFL women's and the hard work certainly starts when you walk in the door. Um, we always say that to our drafted girls and the girls that arrive and think that they've made it, but that's actually where your, your hard work really starts and you've got to um, continually, you know, refine your skills and, and add more strings to your bow and um, and become, a, I guess, a more complete footballer when you walk in the door. Um, there's lots of things to work on. We're really strength-based at, at, at Richmond and it's something that I've um, I think I've shifted a lot in, like starting to work more on your strengths and, and making them your weapons as opposed to working too much on your deficiencies or the areas that you have to improve. I think there's certainly scope for that and you need to, you need to improve those areas. But if you can, um, you know, if you're, if, like Tuke said, if you're really, um, you know, good at, at using the footy and you, you continue to, to work on that, um, and, and that becomes your weapon then, and it's something that you add so much value to the team on. So um, that's certainly what I've done over sort of the last couple of years and it makes it more enjoyable when you're working on the things that um, you enjoy and that you, um, that you are good at because it makes you a better all-rounded footballer as well. Beautiful. And uh, two, this one comes in from Luke. Um, great question. How much time in your week is spent on football opposed to the rest of your life? Um, I know you're a golfer, I believe, golf, uh, too. And uh, and how does that differ in season to, to off season? Um, yeah, well, full time golfer and golf, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, I think it's funny. I, when, when we're in season, um, I think people probably think that we do more than we probably do. Um, you can't be training twenty four seven. But in saying that, I mean, we probably, I don't know, say we went for a normal week, we probably only do we practice probably footy skills, maybe like three, four hours of the week. Um, and that's what I'm saying as a team training, excluding a game. Um, but I think what comes with being a professional athlete is you just never switch off. So um, everything you do, is just always 24 hours. You're always on the clock. So when you go home from training, you probably think about, uh, well, what's my next meal going to be? How am I going to get myself uh, best prep for the next day, depending on what the session is? Um, what time am I going to wake up? How can I get my sleep in? How much sleep am I going to need? Um, you know, when I get up, again, what am I going to eat? Um, how's my body feeling? Um, do I need to do a bit of extra recovery? Um, there's just so, there's so many things that are always constantly ticking over. And in season, uh, I'm sure Katie can um, attest to this, it's just you're always thinking about how can I be better? Um, how's my body feeling? How can I like get myself best prepared for the next day? Because um, I know for I know for me, like um, I know you got a game. Say you got a game on Saturday. I I start my week early and I want to get ready to be the best I can be by Wednesday's training. So we play Saturday. Um, I'm trying to best prepare myself for 
a Wednesday session so that I can you know train as best I can ready for the weekend. Um, but then you flip to off season now. Um, and I mean, for me, I'm really big on having a mental break. Um, I think it's super, super important. You need to be able to release from football, release from all those, um, those ends in terms of like that can routine and that consistency, which can be good. But I think that it's super important that when you get to an off season, uh, I know for me, like I'm trying to go away, not that we can travel for heaps, but in Queensland, it's not, it's not so bad. So I, like I went to Noosa last week, went on a golf trip, um, you know, went away, went away with my girlfriend for a bit. So I, I think that it's super important to be have that that mental space, that mental break away from football. Um, and, yeah, that means that you're probably not doing as many hours um, dedicated to football, but that's okay because I know that when you get back to the season and you get back stuck into it, that um, you're going to dedicate yourself at, at full tilt. So, um, yeah, there's probably two sides of the spectrum there, but I think it's super important to have, have that in you where you can be fully switched on but then have the ability to switch off as well. Um and yeah, there, there's plenty of hours to go into it as well. So, and just to follow up on that, um, with, did you know? Uh, we just had a question from Mason in the chat. Um, did you know that all of that was involved being an AFL player, or was it something that you learned throughout your time at the club? I know you mentioned um, Alex Rigby before um, had, had a big influence on um, on how you uh, train. Yeah, no, nah, um, something I've learned. It's funny, like you're just always still learning. It's it's so crazy, like not in even that I had a breakout year this year, there's still so much I feel that I've got to learn and, um, you know, I bounce off people all the time. I know, I know I got in contact with, with Travis both this year because I wanted to really pick his brain. Like, I mean, we're probably two ends of the spectrum in terms of a man that's, you know, the back end of his career, but also playing some of his best football. But I really wanted to pick his brain because he obviously, you know, he found what really works for him at the age that he's at well. And I just think that it's super important to, to always keep challenging yourself like no matter what you're doing um so yeah like as as you go like you're just always learning lessons and then now, now it's weird i'm 25 and probably considered a bit of a veteran of the club um because everyone's so young but in saying that that's another challenge like you know i need to um, ha- have the ability to step up and, and keep performing and keep being a leader um in the eyes of some of the younger boys um that's something that's always going to keep me motivated but um, I guess that's that's probably something that over the time you're just going to keep progressing, keep learning. Um, so yeah, it's, I, I mean, I've been in the system seven years now, and like it, nothing surprises me these days. It's just always something new that pops up, new challenge, um, which is good. It's it's all part of it. It's just part of playing football. So um, I do I do really enjoy it. That's awesome. And um, just might dive a little bit deeper into that, Katie. I know you've. Um spoken to uh, Travis Polk as well, and um, he's been a bit of a mentor for you as well. Um, could you just dive into that a little bit? Yeah, um, Travis, been, he's been awesome. He's actually a cousin of um, one of our, um, like our footy ops manager within our club, and um, it was a, a great introduction by Fags, our footy manager's ops, um, into to Trav, and I've been able to, to talk to him sort of over um, – leading into the AFL women's season last year. And we had a connection through doing some work um, with Ben Crow, And we've been really fortunate to work with him at the, the Richmond Footy Club. And um, I've done a bit of work with Ben um, individually as well. And I think that came up after um, a bit of a, a form slump and, and probably not playing my, my best footy um, the first year at the club and, and sort of, um, you know, struggling mentally as, as you do go through patches um, in the elite environment sometimes. And, um, yeah, Trav was a, a great a great person to once again bounce ideas off. Um, you know, gain a bit of insight into um, you know how I guess he uh, worked through having a, a captaincy role and not um, you know not having um, not playing his best footy essentially at the time and how he transitioned through that and, and now how um, as Took said how he maximises his performance both on and off the field in a mindset capacity and then a physical capacity too to play his best footy at the back end of his career is just an incredible, incredible athlete, but more so an incredible person. And, and that's a lot of the, the stuff that we sort of talk about that um, you, you get away from footy being your identity and um, you're more of a, a person than, um, you know, than just a footballer. And I think um, by breaking those two things up, um, it's sort of, you know, it gives you the, the space to, to not judge yourself on how you perform out there week to week. It's, it's more about, um, yeah, what sort of person you are and, and having other interests other than just football, um, which I think I struggled with early on. I just loved footy. I loved the game and I was all about it. And, um, yeah, it's certainly been a, 
a great journey, um, some great lessons from some great people. So I've loved working with him. Fantastic. Um, and so, Tuke, uh, what's your mindset like going into the game? This one's from Oliver, who's one of our uh, general footy heads. We've got both yeah. parents and, uh, and general footy heads. Um, do you think, do you actually think about getting as many disposals as possible? Um, or does that just come naturally uh, when you're out in the field? No, nah, no, nah, it's um, oh, it's it's a good question. It's, it's not what I what I think about. That's not to say that does doesn't come to your head. I think anyone's anyone silly if they think that they cross the line and um, they're not thinking about how am I going to go today, uh, whether that's from how many disposals, how many goals am I going to kick, am I going to get a kick, um, all of the above. So, um, oh, for me, it, it does sounds really boring, but I just I can't bang on enough about being consistent. Like, so when I step into a game, um. I try not to have. I try not to peak and peak and trough too much, if that makes sense. So I don't want to be, you know, at a ten or eleven out of ten, if that makes sense. And then I know the next time I'm like a three or a two. So I feel like for me, it's always about being. You know, you want to be in that seven or eight range every time you step into a game. So like for my mentality, if I'm playing a bad game, I feel like that should still be a seven. Does that make sense? I kind of want it to still be a really consistent game. You don't want to go out there and be like. You know, one game you turn it on and you, you have an absolute cracker and, yeah, you might win the game for the team, but what happens when the team needs you the next week and you're not there because I know your consistency levels aren't there. So when I go into a game, mentality-wise, I'm always thinking about, like, how can I be the same performer? Like, my baseline every time I get out there is at this level all the time. So if I'm – even if I'm having a bad game, it's still really consistent. I think it's super important that your mentality going into the game, it shouldn't fluctuate too much. You need to be – every time you step up – you get games where you play really, really well, and that's that's just a bonus. But then those games where you're not really feeling it, you still have the ability to to churn out um, a really good game for the team and actually help them um, when in need. If that, if that kind of makes sense. So um, yeah, I mean, my mentality, yeah, like I said, every single game is just to be super consistent. Um, I think that's a, a really important thing when you play in professional sport. Tuk, can I just ask a question? Um, a bit of a selfish one on the off the back of that that comment, but more so. Um, it would be some good insight for, for coaches trying to help athletes in this position um, and players if they're on this call as well. But if you find yourself at quarter time and, you know, you haven't felt you've had the impact, you talked about your, your triggers and what you um, what triggers you to, to sort of get into that, that um, the A-game mindset. What are, what are some of the things that you use if you're halfway through a game and you, just, you need to sort of use those, those physical cues to get you going? Um, so I lost you for a bit, Katie, but I think you, so you're talking about what a time are you, mm. like, say you having a down, you had a down, yeah, floor, definitely. and then it's how you get yourself back on track, as you said. Yeah, so I think, yeah, it's a good one, because that happens. Like, if, even if you, I think it's more important that you mm. don't get to quarter time and then think that. So, like, I know as a midfield, I'd probably get um, one break a, a quarter, so come off um, in the middle of the quarter. I think it's really important to then reset. And check yourself. So I come. So for me, I come off the bench, or come on. So I come on the bench. I'll go for a walk. I'll get my bottle. Um, I probably don't really talk to too many people when I get off. I try to just reset. Have a probably really quick think about. All right, how have I done? How was my last ten minutes? Um, you know, how how am I performing for the team? And then once I kind of walk a lap, come back, get to the bench. I start to. I'll talk to a coach or I'll talk to a player. Um, just to get a bit of a feel of like what we need out there, what we need, what I need to take in terms of messaging wise. Um, so for me, I think if that does happen and you've had a bad 10 minutes, I think it's how quick can you reset yourself um, and think about, we've got a lot of things at the moment where you, well, you would have heard, but people talk about anchors and, and what you're good at. So for me, I go, well, my two best things is my contested footy and my work rate. So if I'm not bringing those two things, I'm not doing my job. So if I had a bad like a bad patch, I'll probably come off the bench, think about, oh, am I performing for the team? If not, how can I get back to that? And it'll be work rate, get to as many contests as I can. I know if I get to the contest, I'm going to be able to make an impact or do something if I'm around the ball. Um, so as I tell us, this funny thing is like a bit of self-belief doesn't go far as well. So like if you actually believe that you can impact when you get there, it's super important. So like I think this year for me, it was so funny. Like I actually started to, feel that I was like I actually can impact when I get around the ball so I come off I know I haven't done much but then I know if I go back out there get myself to as many contests as I can I'll have an impact at some point I have to because I keep getting I keep turning up if I keep turning up eventually the rewards will come so yeah I think from to answer your question from a physical 
my Q point of view, I think it's really important to reset if you've had a bad quarter or a bad 10 minutes, but it's also important that you're going to have self-belief that you can do what you're really good at. Like go out there with your strengths in mind. This is what I'm going to do for the team because that's how I impact. That's why I got drafted. That's why I play footy. Um, I think it's, I think it's really super important. Mm, awesome. Fantastic. And um, Katie, I know um, you've had a couple of injuries on your, on your kicking leg um, and you've, uh, spent a fair bit of time working on your opposite foot. Um, in the AFLW, uh, how much uh, is that sort of promoted? I guess at um at, at that higher level. Um, it's a good question. I think uh, we tend to to promote it um where we are at Richmond. Um, I think it's yeah, it's something that your left foot or your, your non, non-dominant foot, essentially, it can help to get you out of trouble. And what, come, what springs to mind, essentially, is I read a bit of an article of, um, of how when Luke Beveridge took over, he was really big on, um, you know, bringing your, your opposite side. And he was, he was there at the Bulldogs when we were there at the time, when I was there at the time, sorry. And we would do a lot of work on our opposite side and, and our just essentially our, our kicking technique over short distances and heaps of reps. And I think he was a big part of that coming across to the women's program. But you saw how, um, you know, Bailey Smith, how he gets out of trouble by using his non-preferred and, and you know, kicking one of the winning goals to to progress through the final series and just how important it is to, to be able to use both sides of your body to get you out of traffic. Um, I've heard a lot of different theories along um, my journey, um, particularly sort of in, in TAC programs where it's just, you know, you spend your time working on your preferred foot and, and get that as, as good as you possibly can. And, and yes, um, I think it, it is a good theory, but I also think being able to, to go both sides of your body, you're just a, a much more rounded footballer. I know that I probably kick more goals on my, my left foot now because I've worked a whole lot on it. Um, just through injury and, and not being, I've had a, a bit of a dodgy right ankle for a few years now, um, and just using that as a an opportunity to to gain more skills on the left side. And and what I've found in the past is that by actually Harry's a bit of a, a biomechanic geek, and um, he uh, he's a, a big one for this. But by actually practicing more on your non preferred side, you're um sorry, I've just got a phone call coming through on my computer. By pra- practicing more on your non-preferred side, you actually um, it translates across to your preferred side as well. So I found that um, I had one of my probably more, one of my better years kicking um, this year, this past season, and I ha- actually had an, an ankle injury leading into the season and, and did a whole lot of work on my left side, and I just felt that it transfers across. So um, yeah, I'm really big on on doing it on both sides of our body. Our program's quite big on it too. And I just think that, um, yeah, the more proficient you can be both sides of your body, the more rounded footballer you will be. That's awesome. And um, guys, we're just coming toward the end of the uh, of the session. I might get one more question um, from both of you. Um, so Tuk, what advice uh, would you have uh, would you give a young 14-year-old aspiring football player um, with regards to development? This one comes from Andy. Yeah. Um, it's funny when you say he's someone at that age, I thought footy was everything at that age, which is so it should be. But I think it's so important that you still enjoy what you're doing. So, like, you just have to enjoy going out on the weekend, enjoying playing footy with your mates. It sounds so, like, fluff, but it honestly is true. Like, it's essentially what's what, what, you know, Katie and myself do as a job now. Like, we, we go out and we play footy with our friends on the weekend and we're just fortunate enough to, you know, to get paid to do that and also – um, obviously enjoy what we do um, and, and you know you're out there to win and to be a professional athlete as well but there, there comes with a really good uh, good side to it but I think at that age like it's just so much more about getting full enjoyment out of that um, and, and enjoying footy for what it is because um, it's still such grassroots footy um, and then I know probably as you get older though um, you know you got to start making sacrifices anyone will tell you like as you start to get on sacrifices is so key to you know, getting the success or what you want out of football. Um, you're probably not going to make it if you don't have the ability to, to make those sacrifices. And I'm not going to lie, like you can't sugarcoat it. It, it doesn't mean that you'll be successful um, because I know not everyone gets that lucky or gets that fortunate. That does come with a little bit of luck, but I think it's super important that you give yourself every chance as you get older to um, be the best player and be the best person you can be. Um, I think that's going to make a, a massive difference and, 
it's funny these days, like I, you look at the whole entire um, AFL and there's not much splitting many teams for being a great team and being a bottom team. So what I think it ends up coming down to is the attitude. Like you think you look at Richmond, they won three premierships off the back of a team that had really good attitudes and wanted to win for each other. Um, and I think nowadays you get someone that walks through the door, doesn't matter whether they get drafted number one or whether they get drafted number I don't know, 89. Um, it has no effect. If you've got a really good attitude and you want to be there and you want to win, you want to make sacrifices, um, it makes a massive difference. And I think that's what you get when you um, you start those habits earlier in your career. So um, I think to answer your question, like as you get older, enjoy your football, but when it starts to get really serious, um, I think you just start building those habits um, to what's going to create you a really good um, AFL footballer. Um, I think that's yeah, super important. Fantastic. And uh, this last question comes through from uh, Max Spencer, who's a, actually a coach on one-on-one football and a former teammate of yours too. Yeah. Uh, Katie, you've spent a lot of time around professional and semi-professional environments in your career to date. Uh, what are some of the ways in which you are able to balance day-to-day life uh, with the additional demands of an elite sport? Mm. Yeah, it's a really good question, um, Max. And I think that, um, once again, it's been quite different in the women's league where we're uh, growing and, you know, we're into our um, sixth season coming up. Um, but some of the girls still aren't full-time. I'm, I'm really lucky and fortunate to be able to be um, essentially a full-time footballer now. Um, but leading into that, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of, um, I guess, day-to-day life demands, but also work demands where we've still got girls that are working full-time and, and playing, um, you know, footy uh, in the elite environment as well, just similar to what, you know, the boys do within the VFL program. And we know that it takes a bit of time to, to get to a, a full-time um, a full-time profession. So we're really looking forward to that day where all of our girls can be full-time. But in terms of, um, I guess, balancing it, I think for me, um, football football is really important and it goes back to those sacrifices Tuke was talking about in order to to really improve in, in um, you know something that you want to you want to pursue and you want to be really good at whether it's you know coaching whether it's playing football or, or your um, you know your profession I think you've got to actually dedicate time and energy to that and for me working full-time whether it's you know sitting down in an office that's counterproductive to where I want to go with my football. So um, I essentially created a bit of a, a career around being flexible and being able to um, work whenever I wanted to or needed to, but also really delving into into my footy and um, making the most of opportunities and, and sort of um, trying to train um, as much as I can to be the best footballer I can be and, and to be the, the best teammate I can be and the best leader I can be essentially. So um, I think there's a lot of balance in that and there is some sacrifice. Um, and I think that, yeah, if you can sort of um, get that right in terms of where your prior- priorities lay and, and where your goals are, um, I think you can be successful in, in anything. Um, it takes a lot of hard work and dedication and, and almost like laser-like vision as to, to where you want to go. Um, and I think by, by balancing some of those things, I'm always a massive believer in that you can't do four things really, really well. You can't do three things really, really well. I, I tend to be a bit all or nothing. And this is what I've learned about myself is that if I've got two or th- two things or one thing that I'm really focused on and I can put my energy into that and I can have time away from it if I need to, um, but you sort of switch back on. I think that that's where I've found that I get maximum productivity and, and um, actually make gains towards where you want to go. I think there's a time at the start where I was trying to play footy, I was trying to study, I was trying to work, I was trying to do all these different things and you just sort of burn out towards the end. So that's what, some of the challenges we have as female footballers at the moment. But I think once you, um, yeah, once you really narrow your focus as to where you want to go, that's where you... Um, that's where you start to to really be able to balance the demands. Awesome, guys! Thank you so much for uh, for coming on. And, and um, I know you're both you're both very busy people. So um, yeah, just on behalf of everyone here, I'd love to say thanks for for joining us um, today. But Bef- before you go, I just got to get some tips off you for tomorrow. So who uh, who wins? Who gets the Norm Smith? Uh, I really want the dogs to win. Um, to be honest with you, and I would love to see the bond get the norm smith purely because i thought he should have won the brown though as well so um yeah i'd I'd love to see him and it means if he's winning norm smith he must be turning one on so i'd love to see that (laughs) and katie 
Um, I'm going to go the opposite. I just feel as if that I'd love for, for Melbourne to complete that, that fairy tale. I think the dogs had their, their time in 2016 where they broke the drought and um, for Melbourne to just break the drought and um, being here in Melbourne, it'd be great to, to have some, some more positive energy down here with Melbourne. Uh, oh, I guess both teams are, are Victorian essentially. I feel like I've got a lot of Melbourne supporters around me. There's lots of fences painted in this area. Um, but yeah, for, for Melbourne to, yeah, I guess um, to, to enter a new era essentially to break the drought and to, I think they're going to be quite, both teams are going to be quite successful teams going forward um, in the future with their, their list builds and the leadership around them. So I think that um, it'd be great for Melbourne to get up. And I think that um, maybe Maxi Gorn is doing some, some amazing things out on the field as a, a ruckman. Um, and that'll be a bit of a fairy tale finish for him. Yeah, he's certainly in form and um, uh, just like the two of you this year in uh, in season 2021. And um, yeah, like, like I said before, we're very lucky to have uh, two All Australians and um, two players that have had real breakout seasons this year. Join us on the uh, on the Footy IQ Masterclass. So, um, Tuke and Katie, thank you so much again. We uh, we really appreciate it. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the One on One Football Podcast. If you got something out of today's episode, we'd love it if you could leave us a review on Spotify, Apple Music, or wherever you get your podcasts. If you want to stay updated on special guests, new episodes, and more, please subscribe to the show on your chosen platform. And finally, if you have any questions for Rainsy or myself, or you want to get a particular guest on the show, please reach out. Our email address is podcast at oneononefootball.com.au. Thanks, guys. We'll see you for the next episode.